You know, it is hard uh, not to be thinking about football a little bit this morning, uh, with the conference champs and champions just on the line today. But I like what Howard Hendricks has to say about it, and that is that at a football game, there are 70,000 people desperately, desperately in need of exercise, watching 22 people desperately in need of rest. <laughs> You know, and in some ways, I think church can be a little bit like that, too. Uh, more people attending and observing than are serving and participating. And why shouldn't it be that every member of Living Hope is a servant? I mean, just imagine 150 to 200 people serving in their spiritual gifts. Being become aware of that thing again, that God has given them that salvation, embracing that, growing in that, and functioning in it. I mean, ultimately, those gifts, when you read them, and you read the context of particularly in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, that talk about those gifts, those are primarily for the edification of believers, for building up the church. But certainly we know that God's mission for us is not only build ourselves up in terms of the believers, but also to reach out to the world. Uh, so ultimately, when we talk about works of service and us functioning in the spiritual gifts, it's really exciting to think about what transformation is part of that, what building up is part of that, what, what outreach to the world is present in terms of us really embracing the works of service that God has given us to do. But basically realizing the focus of, of these messages and talking about work of ser works of service and, and what God calls us to is not about us getting things done. It's not just about us being busy. Again, it's not about fixing up the church or, or just doing projects. But it really is embracing what God intended for us at our salvation. You know, if you're not struck by Ephesians 2.10, you really should be. That we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. So what I welcome you to, what I ask you to consider, is what are those works? What has God made you a believer for? That ultimately it is for your salvation, it is for heaven, it is for relationship with God. But again, it's also a part of you embracing the service that God has for you, finding out what that is, and then accomplishing that. I mean, certainly in many ways that is going to be individual in nature. That the opportunities you have within your family, within your neighborhood, with, at your job for works of service. But I can't help but think about what it is in terms of us corporately. In terms of people even with the same giftedness. I would love the idea of people with the same giftedness meeting together to make sure that we at Living Hope are really doing all we can in those areas of that giftedness. You know, just imagine, like, when, when I think about normally how church, churches are arranged, you have a, a, a committee on this and a committee on this and all the different programs and functions that happen. What I think is you have, should have a, a committee of encouragers. And you should have a, get, a committee with people with the gift of helps. And you should have a committee of, of people with gifts of leadership, with gifts of teaching. So ultimately, when you think about all those functions that should happen in terms of the expressions of that giftedness, people talking about that, about how we can equip people in the church to be better at that, how well we can ultimately accomplish the things that God would intend for us as a body. So ultimately, as we continue to look at the what of that service, remember last week I said, I think when we talk about those works of service, we really have to talk about a what a how and the why in terms of those that suggest service. As we continue to think about the what, I think we do need to consider how we might participate in what we're already doing. You know, when we did the financial presentation in terms of looking at the things we support financially, what we might do physically in supporting those ministries. Sunday school, Awana, teens, missions, deacons, point men, women of hope, building maintenance. I mean, what, what would God have for you if you're not participating? In other words, if you really aren't doing anything. And by the way, remember, if you've been in the church more than six months to a year, that's when I think it's time for you to think about what, what place does God have for you here. And so what we're already doing. And by the way, if you are serving, I can't thank you enough. Again, if you are a Sunday school teacher, if you do serve in the one, if you serve in the team ministry, whatever it might be that you do on behalf of Christ at Living Hope Christian Church, or even in your personal lives, thank you for that, in terms of just what you're embracing, in terms of God's will for you. 
But I think we should, what we should also consider are things that are right before us. Drama ministry, nursing home ministry, elderly visit, visitation, involving ourselves in families at crossroads. See, those, things, those are things that are right before us. There are people that are interested in doing that already. Those are things that God has put on my heart in terms of what I believe God would intend for us to do. And people are, are reflecting that in terms of what God is moving on in their lives. But then when I think about what is beyond that for us, what could be in the future, when we think about the societal ills that we face, when I think about us becoming a warm shelter, you know, a warm center, when the, when the temperature goes below a certain point, welcoming people that are homeless, welcoming people that are on the streets, and not having them come here uh, to stay. Is that something God would be doing? When we think about just the horrific aspects of social injustice in the world, whether it be poverty or homelessness or sex trafficking, what part, part does God have in terms of big picture things as far as what God would have us involve ourselves in? But again, there's things that we're doing right now, there's things that are right before us, then there are visions in terms of what would God have us accomplish, and I want to present them, those things to you in terms of what is in your heart. Well, what, what makes, what is your passion? What are your, what are your convictions? Because I think that is also something that defines a church. What do you bring to the table? What are you doing already? In terms of functioning in your, in your spiritual gift, or again, a certain passion that you have. You know, what, what are you doing that ultimately others in the church should come alongside you and join you in? And let me just say that, that parenting itself is a work of service. <laughs> you know, when you're talking about raising children, raising young children, and the work and the energy that goes into that, there are aspects of that work of service that God would call you to in that. But all I would ask you to consider is how directed it is, how directed is that to the kingdom of God? How much is that about you discipling your kids? Certainly bringing them to faith, but then having them grow in that faith. How much of that could be realizing the balance that exists between spending time with your children and not spending time with your children? You know, I think it is important sometimes for us as parents to show our kids that they're really not the center of the world. I think part of the problem with this millennial generation is that we have taught our kids that they're the center of the world, so they expect everything to cater to them. And so there's an aspect of us, you know, leaving our children to say, you know something, there's something more important than you. And that, that one is God. And so I'm not with you because I'm going to work for God. I'm going to serve God's people. I'm going to respond to the call that God has on my life. And I think that's an important element. Now there's also an imbalance where people can do that much and can neglect their kids. So all I'm saying is that we have to be in that balance in terms of what God is calling us to in terms of service to his people, service to the world, uh, that is ultimately still part of us raising kids. Even thinking about service projects or works of service that we can do with our kids. A great thing that we do in terms of being parents and the role he has in our children's lives and works of service is maturing them in the faith and revealing the faith that is part of service. And so finding things you can do together as a family and with children in terms of those works of service. I mean, so much of what we do in works of service is based in relationship with people. So being around, being involved, to just coming out to the things that Living Hope does is such an important aspect of discovering what your spiritual gift is. What the spiritual gift is of other people. You know, we think about the whole idea of the support that God calls us to. When I mentioned, I, I can't think where I did, but laughing with those who laugh and crying with those who cry. You know something? You can't do that if you're not around people. See, if you don't know the people are laughing, you can't laugh with them. You, if you don't know the people are crying, you can't cry with them. So it really starts with us just being involved, being around each other, and taking advantage of all those opportunities we have. Because oftentimes it's outside of the, or in the context of, the, of those relationships, rather, that those works of service happen. Getting to know your neighbor 
Getting to know co-workers, getting to know your community, being involved in the community in terms of different needs that might be present. Again, as, as a way for you to become aware of the things that are there. And again, you could be the very vehicle through which Living Hope does something because you recognize the need and say, you know something, there could be five more people that could do this. And then again, it doesn't become about who you are and you being a good person, but about the church being something and Jesus being something as well. And it is important to remember that works of service are going to be expressed both to believers and unbelievers. Building up the faith of believers and sharing the faith with those who don't know Jesus in a personal way. And basically, if you would be willing to have a conversation with me about this, you know, just remember, as I said last week, you know, this tear-off portion of the bulletin. This also is a way for you to sign up for envelopes, by the way. There's a checkbox for that there if you don't catch Bob or, or Spencer. But at the top, it just says, would you like to be involved in an aspect of ministry? As we talk about the what of what ministry could be, again, if you're willing to talk to me about that, just be open to a conversation in terms of what God is doing in your life primarily and then what he would have you do in terms of the context of the church. Uh, just check that off. But now moving from the what and getting into the how of service. And in many ways, this is the most important part. You know, when we talk about the how, like how do we serve? Because ultimately what we recognize in God's economy is that a right thing done in a wrong way is not right. A right thing done in a wrong way is not right. And really the place to start talking about the how of the works of service really is, a, is Hebrews 11.6. And let me just quote a portion of that where it says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. Without faith it is impossible to please God. So you know what that says to me? That when we think about the things that we would do, we're going to go to a nursing home. We're going to visit people. We're going to go and provide a meal for someone. I'm going to go and I'm going to teach Sunday school. I'm going to work with the teens. That if we're doing those works of service and we think those works of service are pleasing God, they're not. That ultimately the only thing that pleases God is the faith that is part of that service. Do you get that? That ultimately it is the unseen faith expressed in the seen work that ultimately is the thing that pleases God. And see, that's what we have to understand, that, 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 that we have to make a connection to those things that God talks about which are unseen when it comes to the things of what we do. You know, they, you know when, even when you look at the world and you think about the things that they do, a lot of good people accomplish a lot of good things. You know, people do have mercy in them. They do see human need and say, okay, how can we help the poor? How can we, you know, uh, help the, 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 the people in Africa or uh, there's a tornado and let's go. And there are people, good people, quote unquote, doing good things. But you know something, when that's not about faith, when that's not about God's kingdom, when that's not about the resources he's giving me to do those works, see, that faith is not inspiring and driving and motivating that work, then it's not pleasing to God. I mean, you take Hebrews 11, 6, again, faith, without faith is impossible to please God. And then you think of Isaiah 64, 6, where God says there that your righteousness all your righteous works are like filthy rags. I mean, did you hear that? All your righteousness, all your righteous works are like filthy rags, is what Isaiah 64, 6. And I won't get uh, to the graphic nature of what the Bible says in terms of what those rags are. But what basically what it says is that our righteous works are ugly to God. In other words, when we are garnering up energy, garnering up strength, we're in our humanness because of what, what we think about me or what I believe about me or what I believe about humanity is the thing that's driving and motivating the work, that is ugly to God. That, that's not pleasing to God. That's not what God is looking for. So we have to understand in the how of doing these works of service, it has to be about faith. Because realistically... The worst thing that could happen when you hear messages like this 
is that you become guilty and start doing work. The worst thing that can happen is me as your pastor twisting your arm to make something happen. That ultimately, if I am convicting you, if I am reinforcing something that God is saying, because I want, and, and naturally when I teach the word, that's what I'm doing. If that stirs something in you in terms of conviction, the Holy Spirit, all that, now don't blame me for that. That's God doing the work in you. But that's what you respond to. It's not me. I mean, to, to, to be honest with you, for some of you, I get nervous about talking about works of service. Because you are so oriented to your value, your acceptance, based in works, that I don't want to transfer that thinking into the Christian life. I mean, for some of you, and don't take me wrong, really, the Catholicism in you needs to be driven out. The legalism in you needs to be driven out. The Baptist in you needs to be driven out. And that's no offense, if you will, to Catholic people. But for, for a theology and a religion that basically says you have to work in order to be saved, that, that, that basically your acceptance and, and your relationship with God is based in what you do, you can't help but know your relationship with God being oriented to works. And so you have, you have to make sure, as now when you talk about the how of these works of service, you have to realize that it's about God and not you. You know, remember, we do works of service because we are saved, not in order to be saved. We do works of service because we are right with God, not in order to be right with God. We do works of service because we're accepted and loved by God, not in order to be accepted and loved by God. Amen. And I can tell you, I was there. <laughs> I knew what it was like to be on the, the, the roller coaster and the mice wheel, rat wheel, of just turning and turning and turning, spinning my wheels, trying to make myself right with God, trying to get God to love me because of what, what, what I was doing. And sure enough, as you've, if you've heard me talk about this before, I couldn't help but being motivated by guilt or, 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 or pride. That ultimately I was guilty when I was failing, and I was prideful when I was succeeding. But the thing that grace did to me is again, laid a foundation of what I am in Christ and the fact that God accepts me and loves me and I'm righteous because of that, now I do all the works of service I do because that's true. And now the faith that God has, uh, has driven me to is something, or the, the convictivity of, is again, the, um, the thing that is motivating and driving those things. You know, when we think about just that whole dynamic of faith and the fact that Faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You know, just realize, too, that James 2 talks about this whole reality of how works also reveal our faith. So as much as work needs faith, faith also needs work in order to be expressed. I mean, I want you to think about the things you do, the things you prioritize. You know, when you think about what you do with your time, your talents, um, and, your, and your energy... You know, those things express what you think. They express what you believe. For some of you, look at what you're wearing this morning. And that says something about what you believe about how you should look and when, you, when you're in public. Look, look, look at your yard and your grass and your house. It's part of that is, again, about the conviction of what you believe about something. Well, I, I use those as physical examples now to say, what does your life reflect in terms of what you believe about God? And you know, in some ways, you know, I talk about practical atheism in believers, people who believe in Jesus Christ, but when it comes to life, when it comes to function, practically they're like atheists because there's no sign in their life that they care anything about what God thinks. So they, don't, they don't care about God's people or church or the word or the spirit or, or spiritual gifts. Nothing in terms of, again, what, what would be an, an essential part of what God is leading us to. And, and so therefore, we just have to understand this whole uh, dynamic of, again, in the same way that works need faith, faith also needs work to show us and remind us just what we believe. But again, when we talk about how we do it, again, it has to be based in our faith in God. 
And it's, it's clear in Scripture that God does not accept it outside of that. You know, another thing that is true that in addition to the, our, our, our works of service being rooted in the faith of God, it also has to be rooted in the power of God. Again, when we think about the how of these works of service rooted in the power of God. And if you can turn your Bibles actually to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is where we find this. Again, if, 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 if what we're doing and what we're living and what we're accomplishing in terms of these works of service is about God, then it really has to come from who He is. And in fact, when we think about that the only thing that pleases God is faith, that really God can only accept what comes from Him. You know, really there's nothing that we offer Him in terms of our flesh in terms of our ability that can please be pleasing to God. The only thing that's pleasing to God is what we tap into in terms of what He provides, and then we live in that. So therefore, what ends up happening in all the works of service we perform, God gets the credit. We don't get the credit. Because the only thing we're doing is saying yes. All we're doing is submitting. All the thing, all we're doing is just being willing to. Um, to, to, to participate in what God is accomplishing in our lives. And that really comes out in verses 10 through 15 in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It says here, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one of you should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So don't miss that what the Bible is talking about is commenting on the quality of the work we're doing, not the reality of the work we're doing. See, it's not just saying anything that you do that is good and not sinful is pleasing to God, is something that honors God. No, rather it's something that's done that would be considered gold, silver, and costly stones. So it's clear from the passage when you, when again, when you think about what's purified by fire, you know, hopefully you get it, you get the analogy of this gold, silver, and precious stone that makes it through the fire and is made better by the fire. And what happens to wood, hay, and stubble, stubble, that, or, or, or straw rather that's in the NIV? It's burned up, right? So ultimately we want to seek the, the, the gold, silver, and the precious stone and avoid the wood, hay, and straw. So what, what do you think would be consistent? What do you imagine would be consistent with gold, silver, and costly stones? Wouldn't it be grace? Wouldn't it be the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't it be the new nature? Wouldn't it be humility? Wouldn't it be faith? See, it's all the things that come from God and direct us to God. Now, what could you imagine are, are wood, hay, and straw? Guilt, pride, recognition, independence from God, human effort. All things that come from us and are directed to us. But again, the whole point that I'm saying is that when you think about the Christian life, it's not just about the what. It's not just, okay, here are the good things to do, now go do them. It's the how. You know, we, we actually, you know, have kind of a principle here in Living Hope that, you know, when someone is new to the church, we, we say, you know, sit back. Let us learn about you. You learn about us for six months to a year in terms of what you would perform and what way you would serve. Because we want to make sure that what you're doing is grounded in the right motivation. It's based in the right power. Because you know, if it isn't, it will become destructive to you and the people you serve. That ultimately, if you're serving in wrong power, you're serving in the, in the flesh, and again, you think that's what God wants, first of all, you won't make it. 
You won't be successful. You'll be the one that gets burnt out or, or frustrated with the work. Because again, when you in the flesh try to accomplish what God has you to accomplish, you can't do that in the flesh. And then what's going to be reflected to people is that frustration and pride you have in terms of what's functioning in your soul. And so again, it's, it's, it's not just what you do, but how you do it. Now ultimately, I don't think this makes us do nothing. Like the answer is say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, Pastor. You're telling me I can do a right thing in a wrong way? Well, let, let me not do anything. <laughs> That's not the solution. But rather what the solution is, is to engage with the work of God, engage with your spiritual gift, engage with the church, trying to find those things. In other words, whatever these works of service are for you and for us, trying to find what those are, but just understand that God wants to teach you faith through that. He wants to expose his power through that. And so something I would ask you to do, and, and just, just ask me, or tell me if this makes sense to you. That if you went to God and said, you know something, something God, I want to do a right thing in a right way. I want to serve you, I want to internalize the obedience and the service that you call me to. But you know, you, you say without faith it's impossible to please you. You say that my righteous work are like unclean rags. You talk about the quality of my work and building on that foundation in a way that's pleasing to you. God, can you help me figure that out? Can you teach me? Can, can, can I go to someone else who's serving that might be more, more mature in the faith and ask them, you know, what are the things to look for in terms of impure motive or the, the thing that the kingdom of darkness would do to come in and corrupt all that? See, what I'm asking you to do is make it a process that in the context of your serving, just make sure you're going before God saying, through this, I'm trying to build up faith, not build up me. I'm trying to glorify you and accomplish your ends, not mine and my ends. I'm trying to get you glory, not me glory. I, I want to learn what it means to live in your power. I want to learn what it means to be filled with the Spirit. But sometimes what we do as believers, and those are so foreign conflict, but like how do we do that? Well, I, I think that part of what we need to do is engage with God and have Him teach us what that's like. You know, a thought that I'm having in terms of what might be useful is to, and, and this is really a request I would have, if you have a smoke, since you have a spiritual gift, I would ask any of you that are functioning in that gift, you know what that gift is? God has used it in, in a, in, in an, over a period of time. It has been effective in other people's lives. So they recognize you have that spiritual gift. And I would love people to give testimony to what that looks like. How did they discover their spiritual gift? How has it been used? You know, so, so say someone from the gift of, with the gift of encouragement comes up and says, you know, so I believe I have the gift of encouragement. I've been writing letters to people for three years now, and no one knows about it. Guess what? Well, to, to me, that's, that's an expression of the, of the gift of encouragement. But to give a picture to people of what that looks like, because I think in some ways people do, well, if I'm not the pastor, am I really anything? Or I'm not the worship leader, am I anything? I'm not a Sunday school teacher, so am I anything? Again, it's discovering those works of service that each one has been assigned to. You know, there was a, there was a young boy who was trying out for a, a, a school play, and his mom was really concerned about what, what party he might get and what party the party might not um, get. And so she's picking up from school, and she knows the parts that have been, been, been handed out, and he runs to the car, and he's really excited. So the mom's wondering, well, what part did you get? He said, I've been given the role to chat, to, to clap and cheer. <laughs> So to, 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 to support and encourage, to, to, to be part of the audience. But again, to recognize that just because you're not on the stage, just because people aren't noticing you, that's kind of the point in terms of many of the spiritual gifts the Bible talks about. But again, this whole, this whole series of messages, this whole emphasis in terms of a new year, really is what I would have hoped would cause in you is just... Really to think about, really, what is happening in your Christian life. 
What particularly when it comes to these works of service and what is God calling you to? Again, not to earn anything, not to be worthy of anything, but really flowing out of the power of God, the conviction of God, of what God is leading us to. Amen? Amen. Let's follow and let's, let's pray. Father, as I, as I consider uh, you and, and the way you function, it's, it's clear to me that, that, that there is just a what and a how and a why. And Father, as we investigate this and consider it, I, I just pray uh, that you would grow us in this, that, that, that particularly when it comes to our spiritual gift, we would embrace that. We would grow in our conviction of what it is and, and just learn the ways that you would have us function together in those gifts and in those talents even, uh, the abilities that, he, that you've given us. And so Father, I do also pray for those who don't know Jesus in a personal way, uh, Father, just to recognize in terms of just what service isn't able to do. It's not able to accomplish salvation because Jesus is the means of that salvation. That is only by virtue of his death on the cross that we can be made right with God. He took on our sin. He became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. And it's that righteousness that is, that is what we need. And we only receive it from God through faith in Jesus, accepting him as our Savior, accepting the work that he did on the cross to be the penalty for our sin. And so, Father, for anyone that, that hasn't made that step, hasn't come to that realization that it's Jesus and Jesus alone, not by works, but by grace, by faith, in terms of the work of Jesus, I just pray for them that we come to understand that being the message of Scripture. And so, Father, guide us into all truth as we leave here today. It's in your Son, Jesus Christ's name, that we do pray. Amen. Amen.